Hello everyone and welcome to the first event in our Diverse Voices online series. It's great to see you all here today. I'm Ella Clark, I'm Head of Partnerships at the Royal Meteorological Society and I'm also the Management Lead for our strategy on improving EDI at the Society. Um, just a bit of housekeeping from me to kick us off. Um, so please note that we're recording the presentations that are being given by our speakers today. We will, however, stop the recording before the Q&A session starts, so there'll be a, a great opportunity for a full and open discussion. Um, for those of you who may not be so familiar with Zoom, there are some tips on the current slide that you might find useful. Um, so we have two brilliant speakers with us here today. Uh, so we've got Regan Mudhart, a PhD student from the University of Exeter, and Ashar Aslam, a PhD student from the University of Leeds. Shortly, I'll be handing over to our two speakers who will give a proper introduction to the Diverse Voices series and each will then also share with us more about their own experiences working within meteorology. For those of you that are new to our Met, we're the professional body and learned society for weather and climate. We're here to support our membership and the wider meteorological community. And we do that through our work in publishing, uh, through the provision of events which support CPD and wider interests in meteorology and through our public engagement and formal education activities. Um, EDI has been informally embedded into the RMET strategy since 2021. Uh, and since then, societies established a new EDI working group, which is a group of fantastic volunteers from a range of different backgrounds, all with lived experiences and skills to help the society develop and deliver um, activities that are helping to make meteorology a more welcoming space as a science, as a profession and a sector. Um, so the Diverse Voices series is an initiative that has come directly from our EDI working group. So at that point, I'm going to hand over to Regan and Ashar to introduce themselves and to share more about the series and the Early Careers Colour of Network. Yeah, thanks, Ella. So Ashar and I are going to introduce ourselves properly a bit later. Um, what we wanted to start with is, is talking about this Early Careers of Colour Network. So we'll describe what it is and, and how you can get involved um, in a bit um, I mean, today's event, for example, is the first in what we hope will be a series of talks with Q&As and that forms this Diverse Voices series. And that is just one part of what this network is about. Um, and Asha will give some more details about that. But I'm going to start us off by talking a bit about the background, um, I guess, maybe answering the question of why we're setting this up in the first place. Um, and I think that the short answer is probably because we feel that it's needed um, and these ideas came about from discussions with people at last summer's early career and student conference, as well as with the EDI working group that Ella mentioned. And I think that the impetus for some of those discussions and for these ideas was maybe partly from the Royal Met Sox um, member survey last year about EDI. So that's equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, and you could read the details of, of the results of that survey on the website. Um, but what I wanted to highlight was that among the members who filled this survey out and which we might take to be representative of the society's membership as a whole, what we noticed was a real lack of ethnic diversity. Um, and I think that some of us from non-white backgrounds might also tell you, perhaps only anecdotally, that we can kind of see that lack of diversity in the field of weather and climate um, in general as well. Um, and we believe that that is a problem. I mean, I want to recognise that sometimes talking about EDI can be a bit contentious. I know that there were some comments uh, in the survey about the fact that there were no problems with EDI in the society or that EDI initiatives were politically driven, in quotes, or that EDI is irrelevant for weather and climate. Um, of course, I've got and... more, yes. Oh, do you mind going on mute? Sorry. <laughs> um, there was a comment, I think, that that it was irrelevant for weather and climate because meteorology doesn't care about colour. Um, and so is EDI political? I think that the answer is probably yes, because, you know, colour, race, as well as with any protected characteristics, whether it's gender, sex, sexuality, class, disability, I think that these are all inherently political aspects of people's identities. Um, and I, I won't talk about that in great detail because um, I don't want to patronise anyone. And also, you know, there are much smarter people than me who could say it a lot better. Um, but what I wanted to say is that I don't think that EDI is irrelevant for weather and climate at all. In fact, you know, I think that equity especially is probably or should be a key consideration um, in this field. Um, and I think part of that is, you know, there are reports by people like Oxfam, for example, who say that um, people living in poverty, people in, in marginalised communities or in countries in the so-called global south, 
those are the people who are and who will be worst impacted by climate change. Um, and I think for us in the UK, you know, we see the, the impacts of climate change you know, in terms of heat extremes or more intense flooding. But we also see on the news the kind of devastation in, in other countries. Um, and, you know, speaking personally and maybe other people as well, when I see those news items, I sometimes see the pictures and the videos. And I think that I recognize those people as people who could be me or my family or, or just people that... I view as part of my community. Um, and I think in that sense, people of color and women actually in particular, probably have some of the most compelling reasons to be interested in or invested in um, weather and climate because it's it's gonna hit them the hardest. Um, and actually another comment on the survey was something like, you know, if people are interested in weather and climate, then they will get involved. Um, in other words, that person thought that there were no barriers to entry or that if communities were underrepresented in the field, it must be because those communities aren't interested. And I just don't believe that that's true. I think that there are plenty of, of young people of colour who would be really keen to work in weather and climate. But our experiences and the data kind of shows us that they're not here or that they're kind of dropping out early on. Um, and I think that this lack of diversity at the early, mid and even sort of senior levels um, is a real loss. And that's because, you know, diversity in general, whether it's of background, thought, experience or perspective, can enhance and drive progress and innovation in a field. Um, and I really think that diversity can can be for the benefit of everyone. Um, so so why are young people of colour either not considering weather and climate or dropping out early, you know, based on chats I've had with people in the last year, what's become apparent is that people really want to know that they're not alone. Um, I think that if you can see people that look like you kind of thriving as, I don't know, managers or directors or supervisors, then you can believe that that's possible for you as well, that that weather and climate is a viable career. Um, and similarly, you know, when you're in a workplace or a field, you you might face difficult situations. And instead of feeling isolated or that it's you that has to leave an unwelcoming situation, I think that if you feel supported and and wanted by peers, colleagues and, and supervisors, then, then that can be the difference between dropping out and having enough self-confidence to kind of persevere and to pursue this as a career. Um, and so I'm gonna pass over to Asha now, who will talk about these initiatives that the whole idea is, is basically to provide support. Thanks, Regan. Um, so with the new initiative we've put together, our Mets will be helping to support you in two key ways. Um, firstly, for early careers of colour, explicitly, we've launched an online community on Discord. Um, the server's now live, so we'd love you to join and be part of the group. And we'd love for it to become a community where your support network can be provided or help to, be, help to grow. And you can also use to see and share opportunities around jobs, PhDs, uh, postdocs, summer schools, conferences, pretty much everything, or even just to chat with our interesting talks and articles and get to know each other. Um, it's also intended to be a place for discussion and support for people in both academia and industry. The second aspect of the network is this Diverse Voices series, which is starting today. And this is a way to celebrate the diversity that already exists in the field is to demonstrate to young people in early careers that there are others like you and that there are people from backgrounds like yours who have climbed the ladder. At each of them, you, the audience, will get a chance to ask your various questions to the speakers. Maybe you've wondered what it would take to become a professor. Maybe you've wondered what support is available for you as a person of colour who may want to work in the Met Office. But what's also key about the Diverse Voices series is that anyone can attend Anyone can listen, learn, ask questions, and join the conversation. If the EDI survey showed us anything, it's that there are some misconceptions about who has a voice in this field. And hopefully we can both provide role models and show what's possible to early careers of colour, and also introduce the wider RMET membership to some new or different perspectives. And we like the society and weather and climate in general to be welcoming to all. Um, the more people involved, the better. So if you think you can uh, benefit from being part of the Discord server or even contribute to it, then you can join it now using the link or the QR code on the slideshow or here in the chat. I'll note that I will ask you to fill out a short form, but that information is entirely confidential and simply for the safety of people who want to be in the server. And if you, whether you're a person of colour or not, no friends, family, um, or colleagues who you think can benefit from this kind of 
support network. Then please do spread the word and the link around too. And for diverse voices, the next event is in March, where we'll have Suraj Desai from Leeds and Anita Ganasan from Bristol, talking about their journeys to professorships. And then in June, so three months later, we'll then have Leila Goha and Michael Lai from the Met Office. So if you'd like to stay involved, just keep an eye on the RMET events page or newsletters for any future talks. Thanks, Asha. So I'm going to leave the QR code up uh, just for a bit longer, and I will also post the link in the chat a bit later. But basically, we hope that these are initiatives that can kind of um, start some necessary, maybe some tricky conversations, but that will hopefully bring about some change for, for people, for everyone, really, because we really want this to benefit for everyone. Um, and I'll also say that we're hoping to have an, an in-person kind of official network launch at this summer's Early Career and Student Conference. So if you're an early career or student um, and you're thinking about coming along, then keep an eye out for that. Um, and I think the last thing I'll say is that if you have any questions about any of this, then obviously we'll have the Q&A at the end of this and you can ask them there. You can put them in the chat or I've got an email address at the bottom of, of this slide that you can also contact me on um, afterwards. But I think that's probably it from us at the moment. So I'll hand back to Ella. Thank you. Thank you both for that really fantastic introduction. Um, so we'll stop sharing our slides now, I think, so that we can use the rest of the time we've got um, available today to kind of explore a little bit more about how these kind of events are going to work. So I mentioned at the start, we're going to invite Regan and Asha back on um, on to kind of talk to us about their own kind of experiences. So each one will take it in turns to kind of introduce themselves and then we'll go straight into a Q&A once they've both spoken. Um, so Regan, I think that you are first up. OK, no pressure. Um, so I'm Regan. And my first weather related memory is not actually of a real weather event, sorry. Um, basically, when I was a kid, I saw the movie Twister. I don't know how many people have seen it. Uh, so if you haven't or if you've forgotten somehow, um, it is, you know, some might say a cinematic masterpiece from the 90s uh, about a group of people who chase tornadoes in order to study them and to understand them better. And I think that was probably my first experience of weather as something that's exciting dangerous but also something that can be studied um and you know it kind of gave me the bug i was like watching storm chasers on quest um and there was a point where i i was kind of convinced that i was going to grow up to be a storm chaser um but spoiler alert that has not happened um and to be honest i don't think that it will but i like to think that it was that kind of moment that got the ball rolling or set me on the journey um to where i am today um, and so my, my journey is I did uh, physics, maths, further maths and economics A-levels. And then I went to Bristol University to study physics with astrophysics, uh, which is the Brian Cox effect. Um, but in my third year, I took a course which I think is now called like environmental physics. But when I took it, it was called air, water, fire, earth, which I thought sounded very exciting. Um, and it was great. It was all about like the physics behind how our planet works, basically. And so that included uh, weather and climate. And it kind of reminded me of how much I had been into that stuff before. Um, and I remember asking my personal tutor if there were any other courses I could take like that in my fourth year. Uh, and she said, no, um, but she suggested that I might consider doing my fourth year research project with someone in the geography department to kind of get that aspect of climate in. Um, and so for my master's fourth year research project, I was using a climate model, which is a, a mathematical compu computational model um, that simulated the atmosphere, uh, not of Earth, but of uh, Saturn's biggest moon, Titan, um, which is a very cool moon, by the way, uh, literally and figuratively. Um, and I think that, you know, that was my first taste of research and I really loved it. You know, I really enjoyed that project. And at the time I thought, huh, maybe I could do this for a bit longer. You know, I might do a PhD. Um, but after my master's, I graduated and I actually went to work in finance um, for a couple of years. And I will think I'll talk a bit more about that later. But um, while I was working, I, I got an email from one of my master's co-supervisors and he said, hey, I've moved to Exeter. I'm supervising some PhDs. Are you interested in applying? And I read the project descriptions and I was very interested. Um, and so I applied. And, you know, I think I was in a very privileged position because I really felt like I had nothing to lose by applying. Um, you know, I would be sad if I didn't get 
the the PhD, but ultimately I would still have a job. And so, you know, I, I recognize I was very fortunate to, to be in that position. Um, but I guess I got lucky and, um, you know, I did get an offer. And, and so I quit my job in 2021. I moved to Exeter and I came back into academia and I started my PhD uh, September of that year. Um, and now in my PhD, I look at, well, I use climate models, but this time for Earth. Um, and I'm looking at the stratospheric polar vortex, which is this very strong band of winds about 20 to 30 kilometers above the North and South Pole in their respective winter times. Um, and I specifically look at the northern polar vortex and what role it might play in Arctic climate change, weather and climate extremes over places like uh, Northern America and Eurasia. And more recently, I'm starting to look at kind of impacts of polar vortex breakdowns on human systems. So, so human health and, and energy demand and generation. Um, so that's so that's my journey, I guess, uh, in a nutshell. Um, but the other thing I wanted to talk about, which is, I guess, kind of the point of this Diverse Voices series is like my experience of being a minority, I suppose, in this field. Um, and when I was thinking about what I might say for this bit, I remembered how it felt when I went from my very ethnically diverse high school to a physics course in Bristol, um, which was maybe like 70 to 80 percent male, 80 to 90 percent white and how shocked I was as like an 18 year old, that kind of change in diversity. Um, and then I guess in parallel to that, when I left my job in London and I moved to Exeter, came back into academia, I was again kind of surprised by the change in diversity. Um, you know, when I worked in finance, I was in this very close group of five of us. I think there was one man and three of us are people of color. Um, and then the wider department that I was in felt very balanced gender wise, but also, you know, it was very ethnically diverse because it was an American company, but it was a global organization. So there was a lot of international collaboration. And I felt like I was always on calls with people in Asia and South America, as well as Europe and North America. Um, and, you know, in finance, there were, I guess, occasions where I wondered if people were talking to me in a certain way or asking me to do certain things because of kind of, um, I guess, like my gender presentation. But there was never a time where I felt out of place because of the color of my skin. Um, and then when I sort of moved to Exeter and I came back into academia, or I guess since then, there have been times where I felt very keenly aware of who I am. You know, there are moments or I guess there are times in meetings or in rooms where I'm either the only or one of a few people who are not a cisgender white man, um, which I know sometimes people can find that a tricky thing to say, but it's just a fact, you know, I'm, I'm just, I don't fit that description. Um, and I guess I've had experiences that have not been, you know, explicitly racist or sexist, but I have felt have had undertones, I suppose, and um, have made me uncomfortable and have made me wonder, you know, why they're kind of talking to me in that way. Um, and these are sometimes called microaggressions. And I guess to me, you know, those can build up over time. And so it doesn't matter whether those microaggressions are real or perceived, because I think that the effect of them is the same. You know, it can affect your self-confidence and your self-belief because it can make you wonder if you belong somewhere, if you're accepted, if you deserve to be somewhere, if you're capable of doing the job that you were hired to do. Um, and, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only person who's wondered about, you know, being a diversity hire, um, but that's, you know, imposter syndrome talking probably. Um, but then when I look around at my peers and more senior academics, not just at the university, but maybe at like national meetings or conferences, I notice the lack of diversity and it makes me wonder, you know, um, why is that the case? And will I have experiences or will I face kind of these consecutive microaggressions that might at some point become overwhelming and I might decide that actually it's not worth the hassle to stick around in an environment that's unwelcoming. Um, and I really don't want that to be the case for me or for anyone. Um, and so I think that's kind of why I feel so passionate, I suppose, about the initiatives that Asher introduced, because they're basically things that I think I would want, um, as well as the other people that we've spoken to in the last year. Because um, to me, like having a role model or having a support network represents reassurance. And, and that's what I hope we can provide. Um, and yeah, I think I've talked enough. So I'll let Asher introduce himself. Thanks, Regan. Um, so I'm Asher. Um, my initial entry into weather wasn't through weather. Um, I've always just been fascinated by the earth, actually, uh, since I was young, similar to Regan, I was immersed in the documentaries, most on National Geographic, 
Um, things like 30 Seconds from Disaster, if anyone else watched watch them, um, because it kind of covered the processes which led to a disaster, the impact and the recovery, you could say. Um, but within school, loads of different field trips to place around the UK. I got to go to Iceland in year 12, which was mind blowing. Um, but the main source of inspiration for going into more earth science related fields was through my older sister. So she did uh, geology as an undergrad and then a PhD in physical oceanography. And through her work, I saw how cool the earth is. So when it came to selecting A-levels, very similar to Regan, I did further maths, maths and physics, but I did geography instead of economics. Um, I don't think I could do economics at all. Um, but weird enough, over the years, my career ideas changed a lot. So when I was younger, at one point I wanted to be an aerospace engineer, at one point I wanted to do neuroscience. And for anyone who is South Asian, you know the whole doctor, engineer, I'm ticking the boxes. Dink, not quite a lawyer, but I was getting there. Um, but through my form tutor, who was also my geography teacher for six out of seven years I was at school, um, he convinced me to apply for an earth science degree. So I went to Oxford to do a integrated maths, master's in earth science. And as you'd expect, it was covering the whole year. So it kind of fitted my, my desires for what I wanted in a university course. And there were loads of really cool courses out there. Um, and I got to go on lots of different field trips around the UK. I did as well, I did six weeks in Sardinia doing some geological mapping by myself and one other person, which was quite fun. But after my second year exams, I remember having a bit of a breakdown because one, I thought I flopped them, but two, I wasn't sure if like geology as a whole was my thing. So I sat down with one of my lecturers and planned the modules I'd taken my third year and my fourth year. So I ended up specializing in things such as oceanography, geodynamics and volcanology. Um, I did my third year course, I remember looking at Arctic amplification and impact on weather extremes. So somewhat similar to what Regan's doing now, kind of. Um, I knew nothing about the jet stream at the time. I just wanted to do it because I thought it was really cool. And it was a really fun course to do. And then I wanted to do a meteorological masses project, but no one in my department, once again, similar to Regan, would do anything related to weather. So I went to someone from another department and ended up doing a really cool project looking at biases and deep convection rainfall and the causes for them in to the uh, Met Office African models. And from there, I thought, okay, research is really cool. So I went straight to applying for some PhDs and I got one here at Leeds where I'm looking at tropical rainfall patterns in Southeast Asia. So a quick summary, um, Southeast Asia is also known as the Maritime Continent, which is this region with loads of seas of high sea surface temperature and lots of islands with variable orography. And because of the interaction between those two, you get a really high energy source for rainfall and convection in the region. And my projects in my PhD is focused on understanding the different processes from the larger scale to smaller scale, which are more unique to each island. And I've done some quite cool stuff. I've looked at tropical, extropical interactions. I've looked at ocean atmosphere interactions. So it's been really good so far. Um, but going back to the reason for this series, um, similar to Regan, I went from a school which was in the depths of suburban Birmingham, where the school was 60 to 70 percent uh, with people of colour, mostly South Asian, um, to Oxford, which was Quite a shock, but I didn't notice it until maybe my second year, because obviously the first year you're still settling in, you're making friends, that's preoccupying you, and then you're like, oh, I stand out. Um, but I did have some groups to confide in, um, but I did experience some microaggressions and some discrimination, but they operate in other spheres, other spheres related to my, their various aspects of my identity. So it mostly was related to my Pakistani background and upbringing, um, as well as a comment from one lecturer, which stuck with me because it affected me and uh, one other person in my course who was from Malaysia. Um, and similar to Regan, I had no real role models other than my sister and then maybe one postdoc who was in my department. Um, but in the academic world, I've noticed that disparity a lot, but a lot stronger now. Uh, where certain people dominate the space. It's not saying they dominate the space in terms of the voice, it's just presence. I don't really see people who look like me, of similar heritage, 
But I do acknowledge I do have some privilege in that I'm male. So I have seen there are some academics who are South Asian and male. And I acknowledge that aspect of my identity. But I ha- I'm also privileged I haven't experienced any obvious discrimination so far during my PhD. And I have been able to talk directly with academics of, of colour, for example. And I do feel supported by my research team and group, regardless of their identity, because they're just very accepting. But still, I sometimes want to stay in my own bubble because I still think it's a struggle to find that sense of community, wanting more people like me. And it does hurt. Um, But I then wanted to bring about the concept of EDI and involvement in it in general. Um, What we tend to find now is EDI tends to be like a buzzword acronym used by a lot of institutions to say, look, we're doing this, but they never really address the problems. But obviously through this seminar series and talking with people at RMETs, I do feel very strong at the RMETs and the people associated with it do care. And it's really nice to see this uh, seminar series emerge as well as the network that's forming. Um, But I want to point out that regardless the lack of representation throughout the years from undergrad to postgrad, I feel like I've had the energy to put my foot into EDI. So I've been involved with various things. So outreach with school students from unrepresented backgrounds in geoscience. I was a racial and ethnic minority representative for various university societies because they needed one. Um, Various EDI working groups. And I was part of the Equator program, which some of you may have heard about, which was about addressing the barriers to geoscience education in the UK. And I also did a fun little podcast last year on the disproportionate impacts of climate change on people of colour. But the one thing I realised when doing a small EDI officer post last year is that I could still see myself in in these statistics, regardless of the amount of work I was putting in. And that took its toll on me. And I wanted to be working with people who are like me. And that's why I'm also glad there's this community space now where we can talk about our shared experiences. Um, The key point I wanted to make is, even if you see yourself of a certain background, you feel you have to do a certain role, you don't have to. It can be really energy consuming. But if you feel you have some drive and you say, oh, I want to try and see if I can leave my mark and maybe even become that role model you aren't seeing for yourself, do it. Um, Because I feel if we operate within our with our communal drive while both monitoring our own and other people's well-being, we can truly win, I'd say. And you can truly be that representation. Um, and what I also know is that with EDI being discussed in a better fashion than it was before, there are so many more opportunities now that for you to get out there. And I'd say just seize them, be that role model. I remember doing the podcast, someone asked me, oh, how did you get to the position? I said, maybe I'm the role model now. And you know what, that's a really fun thing to um, acknowledge. And you can use your shared experiences to help others, also help yourself. But also, I want to just reiterate, only do it when you have the energy. So in summary, summary, my experience of personal colour within meteorology and climate earth sciences has been mixed. But I feel it's on an upward trajectory, and I think it'll just continue in that fashion. So yeah, I think I've been trying for enough. Thank you both of you very much. Um, Thanks for sharing your stories and your insights um, and a little bit more about your backgrounds and kind of what you're doing now. Um, I think that was that was really great to hear from both of you. Um, So this is the part of the the event today where we'll switch over into our Q&A. 